Hi. Uh, once again, this is Don D'Angelo, professor of uh, U.S. history at Grossmont College and Maricosta College. We're about to talk about the Cold War, at least the onset of it, and the early goings of the Cold War. And we're um, going to be talking about this in, in, in really two separate ways. So the one we're going to talk about now is this, this early Cold War and the onset of the war as it pertains to the Truman administration. And then we'll move in uh, chapter 28 or the next chapter uh, into how Eisenhower uh, handled those uh, same situations. So we're talking about uh, a time period. If you go into um, uh, the uh, available video, you'll get into uh, the availability of a video that uh, one of the authors does for us. If, if you get a chance, it's, it's really well done. Um, so the Cold War is somewhat unexpected, I guess, on, on some levels. Uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were allies different during the war, but there were tensions almost immediately. Uh, they, even, they even surfaced as early as the Tehran Conference, which was in 1943, into November and yet, uh, everybody seemed to kind of want to make the problems go away. So, during, the, during World War II, as the Red Army swept westward toward Berlin, it would retake land from the Nazis and install puppet governments in their place. Now, while this violated the signed agreement, the Russians did not see it as a violation, but rather as self-defense. So they went in, they pushed the Germans out, which would have naturally created what we call power vacuums in those areas. Rather than tolerate that, the Russians said they put in these puppet governments. When Truman inherited the presidency, he was placed into a crumbling alliance with the Russians. And a diplomatic mistake was made when Secretary of State George Kennan tried to use uh, the atomic bomb to put pressure on the Russians to back off from demands. Uh, to prevent uh, Russian expansion in Europe, and uh, Secretary of State Kennan argued that the U.S. policy must be one of containing the Russians. And so we're going to get into this issue about how to handle this uh, perceived threat by a communist regime. And, you know, whether it was perceived or real, um, can, I suppose, be argued. Uh, but these differences with the Soviets were emerging really pretty rapidly. So uh, when FDR goes to Yalta, he's a very sick man. But more importantly, uh, as I had stated earlier, uh, FDR had a very unique quandary. Our atomic uh, bombs had not uh, proven to work we were facing unbelievable casualty numbers against the Japanese, and we needed to end the war. Russia was perceived as a major element to making the war stop quickly, particularly as it pertained to the Japanese. So uh, FDR essentially acquiesced to the already existing presence of Soviet troops in Eastern Europe in exchange for a promise to join the war with Japan. And this was, in hindsight, it was probably a mistake. Uh, when the Russians marched into the war with Japan, they got into northern uh, China and then into the Korean Peninsula. And once they were there, they weren't going to leave. And th this has uh, proved to be a problem for a very long time. So clearly there's a very different approach to economics. Uh, the uh, so communist Russia f followed uh, what we call a, a socialist or Marxist economy and the West or particularly the United States follows uh, liberal economics and so uh, the other thing that had to be sort of dealt with is the oppression of the Soviet regime and, and this is something that is just you know it's beyond question beyond doubt uh, Stalin had a, a, a massive gulag system or prison system set up, labor camps. 
He had wiped out his entire officer, senior officer corps in 1937, 38. There's no question. The man was an oppressor. He was, he was a terrible person. In fact, a, a large numbers of Americans who had uh, become communists in the early 1900s saw the Soviet Union as the shining example and then when the sins of Stalin started to become apparent, uh, a lot of these people became disenchanted and, and left uh, left the Communist Party and even the Socialist Parties in the United States. And um, something that's going to come back to, to haunt them, actually, in, in the 1950s and 60s. But um, the, the idea of containment really came about because... We were sort of stunned. Um, when the war ended, the Yalta Agreement was pretty clear, right? The Soviets were supposed to allow, quote-unquote, free elections in the territories that they occupied. And unfortunately, nobody really sat down and, and, and uh, got Stalin to uh, articulate exactly what free meant. And this is a problem, right? So... Um, now, George Kennan was a career diplomat based in Russia. He had uh, witnessed the revolutions in 1917. He was uh, very uh, versed in the Russian language and the Russian culture and, and history. And he knew Stalin. And he uh, agreed that inherently Stalin was a bad man. And he was, you know, to be dealt with with uh, a lot of suspicion and, you know, uh, incredible care. So uh, George Kennan had witnessed this Soviet aggression. And when in uh, the immediate aftermath, this is 45 and 46, uh, the Soviet Union essentially rigged elections in all of what we would today call Eastern European countries and um, actually killed a number of political opponents that were out there. This created a problem, right? Because for really since 1933, everybody's been projecting this kind of like, oh, Uncle Joe and, you know, these kinds of images of, of the Soviet leader and the Soviet Union that people were not going to just automatically turn on an ally and just be like, oh, okay, let's let's do something about it. But as I had stated in the previous uh, episode, you know, there were more Polish-speaking people in in Chicago than there were in Warsaw, and these people vote, and these atrocities are going to really resonate in the United States, and so. Um, what becomes important is that Kennan does this report, and it was called the Long Telegram. He had sent it into the, to the State Department, and it gets ignored. I don't know if ignored is maybe the right word, but it doesn't get a, a, the kind of attention, at least, that Kennan thought that it should have. So in, um, in the summer of uh, that year, he uh, writes an essay for Foreign Affairs Magazine, uh, anonymously. And he, he signs this article, X. So it's this famous, Sources of Soviet uh, Conduct by X. And it gets huge readership. And so, um, basically, he coins the phrase containment, or the term containment. And by it, he meant that the, the United States of America should use both hard and soft power to keep the Soviet regime contained within the territory in which it was already existing. So, in a sense, you kind of have to accept the fact that he's in Eastern Europe. You got to hope for the best, apply pressure, and hopefully, you know, you will wear him down. Now, this was his prescription. And essentially... In the way I look at it, all the Cold War presidents, from Truman to George H.W. Bush, all the Cold War presidents had some form of containment. And so 
it becomes interesting to see how it operates. But um, and they all have different quote unquote doctrines. But they all are going to basically follow this this model. And it's important, I think, to study it for both its good and bad realities, because in my opinion, we are essentially doing that right now with terrorism, especially is, uh, Islamic extremism. Uh, we, we can't really, quote unquote, defeat it. So we're trying to just sort of contain it and we're tr trying to contain it in the Middle East so that none of it has to be fought here, which was really one of the reasons why we engaged in so many wars back in that time. So, um, now, the Truman Doctrine, which is really a result of uh, Kennan's article, was directed towards uh, the countries of uh, Greece and Turkey. Now, w what do we know at this point? Uh, a communist guerrilla group was emerging both in, in both of those countries. Stalin essentially gives some guns and some trivial support to these groups. Essentially, Stalin sees an opportunity, a potential opportunity, to uh, gain additional influence, but he's not really in it because he doesn't want to overextend himself, in my opinion. So, Let's do a little dabble here. Let's see if something can happen. If it doesn't, that's okay. We haven't really lost that much. But if it works, great. We have two more uh, satellites within the, our sphere of influence. And so the Truman Doctrine is a major shift in American foreign policy. And what I mean by that is when we look at previous wars, all the international ones, whether it's the Spanish-American uh, War or World War I, the United States policy after a war was over was essentially to bring the troops home and to go into a, let's call it a new manifestation of isolationism, right? To, to go back to Fortress America. Truman changes this forever. I mean, this is a permanent change in American foreign policy because what Truman essentially does is he keeps the United States on a, on a, on a what I would call a moderate war preparation footing. So what, what would this mean? Um, the the uh, United States was going to have to keep a certain number of troops in areas of occupation, uh, troops that are still there, right, in, uh, in Germany. And, uh, and this map that you can see here on, on, uh, you know, on this visual, you'll notice that, um, right, Austria had... A zone, right? Austria was divided among the four, the three powers, and then the, um, you know, the United States, Britain, and and Soviet Union, and France are going to divide up, right? Uh, you know, Germany and Ber Berlin, and the United States still has troops there, right? In Germany, in Italy, in J in Japan, right? And and these were done basically, initially, to uh, demilitarize and uh, denazify, if you will, the Germans, uh, and, and to essentially um, avoid having a uh, worse regime emerge out of the vacuum that's going to happen after the Nazis are gone. So this idea of containment has this hard power part, which was essentially the United States giving money and guns and training to the Greeks and the Turks so they were able to defeat the communist guerrillas there. Um, and then to also do more soft power. And the best example of this is something called the Marshall Plan. Now, the Marshall Plan would draw the Western European nations closer together, but it would drive the United States and the Soviet Union farther apart. So this was announced by Secretary of State George Marshall. Now, George Marshall was the, um, uh, the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, basically, during World War II. He was the man who reported directly to FDR in reference to war strategy. He's the man that uh, basically appoints Eisenhower to his position and, you know, all the rest of the guys, Nimitz and MacArthur, right? All of them are 
basically working under Marshall. Marshall is made Secretary of State after the war, which in and of itself was a statement uh, by Truman. And, um, and in a message to graduates at Harvard... Uh, George Marshall said that, you know, the, the um, devastation of the European countries was a threat to uh, international peace and security because um, in all these countries, particularly in places like Italy and Spain and, uh, well, I mean, Spain wasn't in the war, but Spain was still struggling. But there were, uh, in France particularly, uh, there were very large communist parties. And the fear was that if the economies um, uh, kind of uh, stayed bad for too long of a period of time, uh, these regimes could could fall and, and be taken over by communist regimes. And so he recommended that um, the United States provide literally billions of dollars of loans. This is in 1947 and 48. And so, the, you know, you've got these um, uh, offers, basically, to help all the European countries. And this is the key, I think. It was offered to all European countries, not just Western European. And they had to come in with a list of, essentially, internal improvement or, or public works projects, right? Infrastructure projects that they needed to get done in order to repair their, their system. And the United States would issue loans to these, like very low interest loans to these countries. Now, all, uh, all the countries that I th can think of go. And in fact, the Russians go. It's a meeting in Paris. But when they get to the conference, uh, the Soviet foreign minister, Molotov, smells a rat. And that's because the underlying let's say, commitment in the Marshall Plan was that your infrastructure had to all be coordinated. In other words, a borderless European infrastructure. So rail lines, uh, roads, canals, right? Anything that was being built or constructed had to be in an open free market system, which, of course, the Soviet Union is never going to agree to and will never want any of its satellite states to agree to. Molotov leaves, uh, says that um, you know all the other ones that were there had to leave. And so um, now, um, the the what happens, of course, is or I, in fact, if I remember correctly, the Czechoslovakian uh, delegation chooses to stay, and. Um, uh, the the pr president of the Czech of Czechoslovakia uh, sort of accidentally falls out of a three story window to his death, um, uh, which was somewhat interesting. But anyway, um, this is going to be over seventeen billion dollars in loans to countries, and it's it's exclusively to Western European countries: Italy, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands. Right, Denmark, Norway, uh, even some stuff is going to go into Switzerland. I mean, it's there's a lot of uh, stuff that is going to be done under this program, England, and this is going to draw the Western alliance closer together because of these so much, uh, I guess, handout of money. And and to my knowledge, most of this has never been paid back, and you know, kind of silly. And uh, now, what happens then is the dividing of Germany becomes a big issue. Now, as you can see from this uh, map, it was a, a very big, uh, let's call it uh, patchwork of occupation zones. And we had um, begrudgingly kept forces there. Now, we wanted to share occupation uh, with the British and the French. And we wanted to be able to do this 
to essentially save money and to uh, basically demonstrate that it was a collective responsibility, not a singular one. But almost immediately, and when I mean almost immediately, I mean this was done in 1945 at the, at the Potsdam Conference. By 1946, there's already a problem. And the problem was this. The French and the British, mostly the French, were broke. They couldn't really afford to pay for the upkeep of these programs or the occupation. So in 1948, right, uh, Britain, France, and the United States decided to consolidate their occupation zones. Now, this was... Um, really just sort of a logistical thing it, it, it now because instead of having checkpoints if you can kind of see on this map where all these little right all these little borders were in theory right every time you cross those you'd have to show your identification papers well that's a nightmare right and uh and the british and the french couldn't afford to do them so they met in uh, they met in London and they decided let's just consolidate it. We'll just all be under one directive. Now, Stalin sees this as a threat, and again you have to go back to Potsdam Conference. The Potsdam Agreement was really actually, I mean, in fairness to Stalin, it was pretty straightforward. We're going to break up the country. We're going to occupy it militarily. We are going to demilitarize this country. We are going to round up all the Nazis that we can, except for the scientists that we're going to sneak back to our countries and use for military purposes. Uh, and then we'll get back together and we'll decide what happens to Germany. That's, that's basically what it was. This meeting in London to Stalin was evidence or proof to him that the, as the rest of the Allies, right, are going behind his back, are going to try to reunite, uh, are going to try to reunite Germany without Stalin's consent, or at least his feedback. So he decides to do a demonstration to let the other members of the occupation forces know that they're going to have to deal with Stalin if they're going to reunite Germany. And so we get what's called uh, the Berlin blockade. Now, as you can see here, Berlin, which was the capital of uh, Nazi Germany and Imperial Germany, was 100% inside the Soviet occupation zone. It had just one corridor connecting the western part of Berlin to the western part of Germany. And so Berlin was divided just like Germany. There were four zones, uh, each with a different country of occupation. And so um, Stalin, by the way, was against giving France a, a, a piece of that. And, and we, we insisted, which I actually have to agree with Stalin. I don't know why France qualified for an occupation zone. It, it, it really didn't do anything except surrender. But the, uh, the French zone here gets basically taken out of the British and the American occupation areas uh, because Stalin refused to, to render any of it. Now, what happens? Stalin basically brings troops and blocks off this corridor, which was basically a freeway and a rail line. So now supplies coming in from West Germany are going to be blocked. Hence the blockade. Now, what Stalin did then is to basically um, dare the alliance to break his blockade, which of course would be an act of war. Now, you know, what are you going to do this, right? How are you going to do this? Uh, the United States uh, immediately thinks, right, immediately thinks of uh, George Kennan's writings. In it, Kennan had said, look at all of Russian history. Russian regimes as far back as Russia has existed 
have always been incredibly hostile, violent, uh, disrespectful of international norms, desirous of warm water ports for their fleets, and only really respect um, tough pushback. So when this happens, the new president of the United States, Harry Truman, right, basically believes that Stalin's trying to push him around and trying to, you know, take Berlin. So he orders what's referred to as the Berlin Airlift. And this is in 1948. And essentially, the United States and Britain are going to fly airplanes 24 hours a day, seven days a week with supplies in and out of Western Berlin and basically dare the Soviet Union to shoot the planes down. And, of course, Stalin doesn't do this because Stalin is vulnerable at this point. He He's showing a tough hand for no question, and he's brutalizing Eastern Europe. But the fact is, he couldn't sustain a major conflict if one were to come then. Uh, more importantly, he didn't have the atomic weapon yet, so the United States could uh, literally do some serious damage. So... Eventually, he backs down. Stalin blinks, as it were, and it becomes our first episode of what we call brinksmanship. And brinksmanship is a Cold War term, really. That means the two enemies go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, they're right on the edge of the cliff, and somebody blinks, and the crisis is averted. And so, um, Stalin was the first one to blink. And what this did, however is almost the opposite of what Stalin was hoping. Stalin hoped that this would create conflict within the alliance and that he could go in and kind of like uh, muscle his way through. Instead, it led to the creation of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So the countries around uh, Germany saw Stalin's actions as a direct threat to all of them. And so they all agreed to form a collective security regime called NATO, where they would all share military uh, alliances with each other, um, which is now a group of, I think, 28 countries. And, you know, it's, it's, a, major, um, it's, a, it's a major turning point in, in American foreign policy, because remember, all the way back to George Washington, we were told to avoid... Uh, permanent, unnecessarily foreign entanglements. And here we are uh, doing exactly that. So NATO gets formed in 49. Uh, the Western sectors of Germany are united into the Federal Republic of Germany uh, in 1950. Well, actually 49, it goes into uh, place in 1950. And then uh, Stalin's going to scramble and essentially force the Eastern European bloc into what's called the Warsaw Pact, uh, which is basically the Soviet Union brings their troops in and occupies and, you know, you guys just provide troops and we'll train them how to be, you know, evil. So this is basically what happens. And so what goes on in the United States is not a demobilization, but a remobilization. So our forces are going to stay They'll be rotated out, but they're, they're going to remain for a considerable amount of time. In addition to that, the United States will never de fully demobilize its um, war-making machinery, what's later going to be called the Military Industri Industrial Complex, or MIC. Um, and this meant that in previous wars, if you will remember, uh, when we were mobilizing, we had to convert consumer factories into defense factories. And then after the war, they would retool again and go back to making um, civilian commercial products. Well, that's over because the demand from the government for military equipment is going to remain somewhat constant. And so, um, you know, the Ford Motor Company, Boeing, um, you know, all these different manufacturers instead of having just one facility, are now going to have separate facilities dedicated solely to defense contracting. And, and this uh, puts, keeps America in a perpetual state of readiness.
which has a number of problems that we'll get into in, in later chapters. So now that was Truman's foreign policy issue. Now, uh, Truman doesn't have a really good start at the beginning. And, and this is, you know, it's not his fault, right? Tr Truman had been added to the Democratic ticket in 1944 when FDR ran for his fourth term. He was virtually unknown in the Senate when he was a, a senator from uh, Missouri. And was, so when he was chosen to be the Democratic vice president, I mean, people outside of the party had no idea who he was. When he came into the presidency... He replaced many of FDR's cabinet members while favoring many of the New Deal programs that were in there. But you have to remember at this point, you know, America uh, during World War II is just pumping out industrial stuff. I mean, there's, there's virtually zero unemployment by 1943 in the United States. It was possible to lose your job in the morning and have a new job, probably making more money by lunch. And it was just a, a, a really unbelievable thing. So the idea that you needed a New Deal program uh, was really pretty um, questionable. But many people believed, certainly the economists at the time, Keynesian economists at the time, were very fearful that the moment the country did demobilize, there would be a recession, if not a depression, similar to what happened after World War I, and the United States would be in, in a rather uh, difficult situation. So by 47, the military had shrunk from 12 to 1.5 million. And this placed many veterans in need of employment, right? You're, you're Essentially, you're going to have, uh, you know, close, just over 10 million men coming back to the United States all at once looking for work. And this terrified people. And so... Um, Congress is going to um, uh, have to do stuff about it. And so Truman is facing the potential of a dramatic and almost uh, immediate slowdown of the economy. And this was going to be uh, pretty bad, right? So the pressure was to bring the boys home. And of course he does. There's going to be a huge sh housing shortage. Uh, the rents in apartments uh, soared. Um, you know, people would have to um, live in garages. They're living in uh, campers. There's um, former um, storage trailers that were being used uh, in, in former mash tents and stuff like that were uh, set up for people to live in. That This is how bad the housing situation was because all through the war, virtually no houses were built. So these young men who may have left at 18 are coming back at 20, 21, 22 years of age. And they're, they're, you know, they're ready to get married and, and settle down. And so the conversion to a peace economy was uh, a real threat, right, to people. So rent controls were brought in. Uh, Truman is going to end rationing. And this is almost a decade before uh, other countries end rationing. Right. I mean, the Soviet Union, I think, was rationing up until the 1980s, for crying out loud. Uh, Great Britain uh, had rationing until the 60s, I believe. Uh, so, but Truman did this to uh, unleash consumer demand in the hopes that it would um, uh, prevent any kind of a, a downturn. And, uh, of course, Keynesian economics, which came about from, um, you know, FDR's New Deal, is now going to be essentially embraced as the new um, uh, domestic policy formula, right? The United States government is going to intervene when they think the economy is going bad and do things to help bring the economy back. Now, one way to do this was to um, keep some of those returning soldiers off the unemployment line. And this is going to be done through something called the GI Bill. Now, that was, was signed under uh, FDR, but it's going to be um, implemented mostly under Truman and Eisenhower. And th this is a huge, huge boon to the economy. Over 2 million returning veterans are going to take advantage of the GI Bill uh, for education purposes. This is free college. And this is going to be for people who are going to be first generation college goers. And it's massive in terms of its impact. 
uh, not only did it fill schools and uh, spur all kinds of research and, uh, you know, um, publishing of, of information, but it's going to train the future leaders of the United States, particularly the economic ones. And uh, in addition, low interest loans were going to be offered to veterans to build homes. Again, uh, building homes is a major economic stimulus because whenever you build a house, you need all the supplies, you need the workers, and the supplies are going to have to be built by workers, right? Whether it's wood or cement or electrical wires, furniture, carpets, right? I mean, it's unbelievable spinoff effect to the economy. And so um, Truman has this unique scenario where containment in the foreign policy realm meant that not all the boys were going to come home. In fact, more are going to be sent. Uh, but uh, a certain level of guys are always going to be off the you know employment line and the uh, domestic policy is going to allow for the federal government to intervene to help with the unemployment picture and we get what I refer to as the post-war consensus and and this basically was a bipartisan consensus which I'm sure for most of you guys out there sounds like a very strange thing right Democrats and Republicans agreeing on something but in this case what happened was uh, the consensus was built around these two notions, containment in the foreign policy and Keynesianism in domestic policy. And the fact was, or I should say the understanding was, uh, tacit understanding of course, was that so long as you kept within those two areas, um, you might flip back and forth a little bit or tweak it differently, but essentially you stick with those two theories, you got what you wanted. And so uh, Republican Democratic presidents could essentially steer a path of, for lack of a better word, moderation and almost ensure themselves that their policies are going to at least be uh, passed and allowed to be tried uh, before they're shot down. And this basically helps the economy uh, go through. Now, here, here is something that becomes rather important. During the 1940s, in fact, 1944, uh, a researcher, uh, Gunnar Myrdal, uh, wrote a book called The American Crisis. In it, uh, Myrdal examined just how much women and minorities were sacrificing in order to make the war a success. In order to bring victory to the Allies, Myrdal was able to demonstrate that there was real, genuine valor and sacrifice being made by these groups. And he asks this question, which was essentially, what is going to happen if these people come back from the war and they're being asked to go back to the same country that they left before the war? And he says they're not. They're going to be discontented. And so what um, I talked about this previously after World War I, but after World War II, it becomes even more intense. And that's because uh, African-Americans are going to come back from the war and demand more status and agency. They just deserved it, and they, they are going to now insist on it. And so um, Truman responds in 1947 by integrating the army huge resistance to this, particularly in the South. Uh, but Truman decides that it was absolutely stupid. All the records from the war showed that black soldiers and white soldiers had similar statistical success stories, if not better, right? Same with uh, all Japanese units that were used for by the United States. So there were all sorts of statistical realities, and of course, just common sense to us, that, you know, there's just no reason to separate uh, military personnel because of race. Uh, and this becomes a problem. So the next, obviously, comes in 1948. Jackie Robinson, who's pictured here, 
is going to be hired by the Brooklyn Dodgers to play in Major League Baseball, becoming the first African-American uh, to be hired. Now, um, this was a big deal, right? And so uh, what happens is um, uh, he, Jackie Robinson uh, is going to go on the field and become like MVP. Uh, he illustrated that segregation was based on racism and, and not inferiority, right? It, it, was, it, was, it was just, you know, stupid. And uh, he's going to be quickly followed by other African-Americans uh, brought into baseball and then football and then later basketball. And th this was a sign that people were looking for a change, right? And so the shaping of the fair deal comes out of this in a sense, right? So, you know, we had the square deal, the new deal, and now we're getting the fair deal. Uh, Truman knew that there was large sentiment against the new deal programs. Now that the economy was basically uh, uh, growing again. And so he wanted to uh, engage more government programs, but need to make it seem uh, more, let's say palatable. And so he uses the word fair because that's, that's a word that everybody basically responds positively to, right? You, well, I just want to be fair, right? And, and this is a term that politicians like to use a lot still in order to sort of uh, defang opponents, right? So um, this is now the Democratic Party switching philosophies uh, for, the, um, for the Democratic Party they used to be very anti-federalist. In fact, they were fundamentally anti-federalist up until the Civil War and Reconstruction. After the Civil War, however, uh, the Democrats started to move uh, in a different direction. Uh, they were moving from the right to the left. And this started in the Progressive Era with Woodrow Wilson, but it's really FDR and his push on the New Deal that moved the party significantly to the left, or what we call a federalist philosophy or nationalist philosophy. This is a loose construction of the Constitution. This is a belief in judicial activism. And um, the Republicans, of course, are going to be switching as well. The Republicans, believe it or not, started out in 1854 as a federalist party. They wanted the federal government to end slavery, and they wanted the federal government to force the southern states to stay loyal to the Union. And they wanted uh, a national protective tariff. They wanted a national bank, right? They needed all these different things. Now, in the 1940s, the Republicans are reestablishing themselves as the right-wing party and the anti-federalist party, which is what they, they still, uh, do today. Here we have um, uh, a picture of some of the demonstrations that were going on. And again, right, it, I'm, I'm showing you this, not just because it's in your text, but because uh, if you think about it, um, uh, we think so much in this country today that the civil rights movement is a 1960s thing. And the 1940s were very, very uh, big for, um, uh, you know, you know, uh, rights for African Americans and for women, particularly. Um, this is a demonstration at the 1948 presidential election. So now, it's a unique... Uh, situation here because uh, as you know uh, Truman wasn't elected president he became president because of the death of FDR and so um, the uh, the big question in 1948 was could Harry Truman get elected on his own again he was a virtual unknown person three years earlier and so uh, there was a question as to whether he was going to be able to pull this off and what happens is there's exactly what everybody feared. There's division within the Democratic Party. First, the far left, which was uh, considered the New Dealers, uh, the Progressive Party, gets recreated. Uh, Henry Wallace, who was um, the former vice president before Truman, uh, gets into a fight with Truman over foreign policy and, and, and leaves and, and forms or I should say reforms, uh, the uh, Progressive Party. Then the far right 
of the Democratic Party, right? The old Democrats, the Dixiecrats, uh, formed a separate party called the States' Rights Party, or officially the Dixiecrats. And this was uh, a Southern Democrat rebellion, and they're going to nominate Strom Thurmond. It's an interesting figure, Strom Thurmond. Uh, he's going to go on to become a Republican. He will um, become a senator, and he will stay in the Senate until 2001. He will be the first and so far only person uh, to serve in the Senate at the age of 100. Uh, and um, uh, quite a feat for that guy, right? So the Democrats weren't just divided two ways. They were divided three ways. And so uh, the Republican Party quickly f demonstrated its unity and they uh, all came and uh, settled on renominating Thomas Dewey. So Dewey was the nominee in 1944, and they renominate him in 48 because they assume we have an affable, nice, popular New Yorker, right? Just a, a, a very, you know, good, popular guy. Um, all they had to do was not make any mistakes. And uh, so the theory of divided opposition. Uh, put um, the Republicans on what they thought would be easy street. And we get one of the most studied elections in American history. In fact, it, it changes how polling is done, uh, was done at the time. So what happens is that um, uh, the election night in November of 1948 goes on. And as you can see, uh, uh, Dewey sweeps the Northeast, which at the time was the largest electoral uh, collection you could get. And so um, uh, everybody assumed that he was winning big time. So uh, they got to uh, Chicago and the papers there determined that uh, Dewey would probably carry the day. And so we get the famous Chicago Tribune uh, headline, Dewey defeats Truman. But after the East Coast went to bed, the West Coast finished up. And as you can see, he s virtually sweeps the West, Truman, and he wins. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a very famous picture of Truman holding up the newspaper with this big, uh, you know, kind of shit-eating gr grin on his face, kind of like, "Hey, look, I lost." Uh, when he, in fact, didn't win and didn't lose at all, he becomes president of the United States. So here are the Dixiecrats in the convention, 1948, screaming and hollering and insisting that they're gonna, uh, if they don't get the nominee they want, they're gonna move out. And and the, and by the way, the the number one reason why they they what I should say launched their campaign was was. Uh, Truman's integration of the army. And so, um, as you can see, the Cold War really starts to heat up at this point. And so, um, uh, in 1949, China falls to communism in what we call the loss of China. And, uh, and the Soviet Union is going to detonate a, a bomb, an atomic weapon. And this is going to launch what we call the new Red Scare. And so um, Truman is going to literally purge the Department of State. And this creates all kinds of issues because a lot of the uh, uh, people who are dismissed from the State Department aren't just going to lose their job. They're going to be blacklisted, which means they can't get work anywhere in government. And many of these people were career experts in particular, almost the entire Far East Asian uh, desk of the State Department gets removed. And this, all that knowledge, and so what's interesting about that is, this is 1949-1950, when war breaks out in Korea in 1950, virtually all of the experts on Korea are not in, not in the job anymore. And you couldn't even right do anything about it, right? So for China in China, this was a big problem because the United States and China had since 1899 had a rather unique and and stable relationship. 
And America kind of always felt like we were the sort of big brother to China and we would quote unquote manage China. And, you know, when the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek uh, were uh, forced out uh, by the communists under Mao Zedong, uh, this is a shock to Americans. And so um, Truman essentially gets blamed for losing China to the communists. So when war breaks out in Korea, Truman feels compelled to do something or he's going to be seen as weak on communism. And so the United States is going to go to war in Korea, which at the time was called a, a police action. It's, a, it's the first war essentially declared by the United Nations. And, uh, and, and so um, the United States Congress will simply issue a resolution to um, authorize uh, Truman to use force in Korea. And he's going to turn the war over to Douglas MacArthur the hero of the Pacific and MacArthur is going to do what MacArthur always did, which is to be a bull in a China shop. He rescues South Korea and then pushes into North Korea and he gets in and uh, is threatening Pyongyang, which is the capital of North Korea. The Chinese through diplomatic channels uh, basically lets it be known that if uh, more and more North Koreans cross the Yalu River into China. China is going to get into the war in favor of the North Koreans. Uh, Truman basically orders uh, MacArthur, or I should say tells MacArthur that he needs to cool it and to stick to the program, which was to simply kick the North Koreans out of South Korea. And MacArthur makes this famous line that he quotes in public saying, there can be no substitute for victory. Right, you don't play to, to to a tie, right? And um, when Truman tells him that communications are coming that the that the China could enter the war, essentially MacArthur's response is nuke China, which is just you know jaw dropping. And so um, instead, we're going to launch a conventional war, which is going to drag on for three years. And uh, this is the beginning of uh, really the undermining of this uh, Cold War containment policy. Uh, but this fall of communists, or I should say the fall of the nationalists in China and the invasion of South Korea terrifies Americans. This was a sign that the communists were winning, that we, the good guys were losing, and that, um, you know, we needed to do something about it. And the fear became that communism was not going to spread everywhere and possibly even into the United States. And we get what's referred to as the Red Scare, which is the modern Red Scare that most people think of, uh, which, but it's actually technically the second uh, Red Scare. So what's going on? You see it right here on this list, right? There's multiple misunderstandings that are going on here. This is, uh, I got to be the tough guy. I got to do what's right. You're going to back down. You have to give in. Uh, every action is seen as an extreme uh, overreaction by the other side. Uh, both sides are going to engage in what I refer to as hyper-nationalism or jingoism. Uh, the, the, um, the big difference now is that uh, when the Soviets have their own atomic weapon, uh, we now uh, are facing a different enemy. We're facing a threat from um, uh, outside that could uh, lead to the most horrific form of death you can imagine, right? And so in the picture you see here is uh, Senator uh, Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin. And he's the gentleman we'll talk about in the next chapter uh, when we discuss McCarthyism which is this pressure to conform in all areas of American life because you don't want to be seen as anti-American or uh, as a communist sympathizer. Uh, if you're a communist, you're red. If you're a sympathizer, you're pink. And so we'll get this language of the Cold War. You know, you're a pinko. Uh, 
And so this becomes political fodder. And the Republican Party is going to latch onto it, as will, by the way, as will conservative Southern Democrats. And they're going to look at the repression of the Eastern Europeans, which is real, as proof that the uh, that the Russians are trying to take over, and that the Americans need to come together to unite, to conform with each other, and to create a stable, powerful economic and military response to the spread of communism. So the commitment to NATO gets stronger, more troops are going to be sent to Europe, and the uh, the military presence of the United States all over the world is going to become permanent. And these are things that matter a lot to us because we're still in this, I would call, uh, uh, war footing in the United States. And this is a major, major change in American history. So when we get back together, we're going to talk about how McCarthyism and how the Cold War gets sort of articulated in the 1950s under the new president, Dwight David Eisenhower.